I am so excited for you to meet Meredith Eaton, entrepreneur extraordinaire, and she's going to share some of her extremely interesting career journey with us. Hello, Meredith. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. It's so good to see your beautiful face. Aw, it's so good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. So let's go through your uh, unbelievable career journey here. Hollywood actress and producer. Then you started your own catering and personal chef business after completing culinary mm -hmm. school. Plus there's the hats of mom, a wife, and now you've become a theater producer. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Can you uh, take us through that path and how you were able to seamlessly pivot from one successful career to the next? Okay, so I started college thinking I was going to be a political science major, and I thought I would go to law school, but you know, I'd always done theater in high school, and I loved it, and I got to college, and it was time to register for classes, and I registered for every theater class they had, and so it was just a short while into that freshman fall semester that I went, hmm, <laughs> everything I love is in the theater department. And um, I'm falling asleep in my poli sci 101 class. <laughs> so maybe this is telling me something. So I decided to switch and become a theater major. And fortunately, I did not have parents who said, that's not practical. How are you going to make a living? They said, if that's what makes you happy, then do it. We're not going to tell you, you know, not to. So um, I graduated with my theater major, and then I moved out to California, and I did a season with the San Diego Repertory Theater, and then I decided that um, I thought maybe I wanted to do stuff in film and television more than theater. I thought life in the film and television world might be a little bit easier to get work than, you know, moving to New York and auditioning for Broadway and things like that. So I moved to L.A., where I had a long career as a waitress <laughs> with acting jobs as they came along. And, um, you know, after a while, I found that the frustration of not having um, a weekly salary that you could count on, and even more the feeling like my brain was sort of atrophying that you know, you'd book a job and you'd be on set for three weeks and then you'd be right back to your job in the restaurant. And it f just felt a little demoralizing. And I felt like I'm a smart person. And if the, the most intelligent thing I'm saying in my day is, do you want fries with that? <laughs> I, I feel like I'm dying a little inside. Yeah. So I took a job as a production assistant that came along. And I figured out pretty quickly because of things people had told me in my life about, you know, if you want to succeed in a job and move up in the world, look around what needs to be done, do it before you're asked to do it, find ways to do things better, more efficiently. And, um, you know, people recognize that and you get promoted pretty quickly from getting coffee to, you know, doing things a little more important. So, um, I ended up eventually working as a producer. I produced um, a and &E biographies. I did a lot of documentaries for the History Channel. I did talk shows. I did The Dating Game. Uh, I worked for MTV, worked on some real world and road rule stuff, um, worked for the Food Network, and that became my second career, you know, from actress to producer. And I loved it. Um, I got married. My husband and I relocated from LA to the East Coast and got pregnant with my first baby. And I knew that I wanted to be home with my kids. That was just really important to me. So um, worked right up until <laughs> I went into labor <laughs> for <laughs> kid number one. And then I was a stay-at-home mom. And I was in a... Um, a new state, a new city, because we had relocated to New York by then. And we hadn't lived here that long before uh, I had her. And I didn't really know anybody. 
you know, I was home with this baby, didn't really know what to do with myself. And as much as I loved being with her and wouldn't trade a second of that, already my brain was going, I need something for me. I need something. I need something. So um, when I had been living in LA producing, on the weekends, I started taking culinary classes just because that was an interest of mine. And I took more and more and more and more classes until suddenly they were like, um, you, you really kind of have enough <laughs> for a degree, a culinary degree. <laughs> so when I was home with this baby, I thought maybe I can do something with that. And I started taking some pastry classes, some cake decorating classes, and started practicing at home, posting pictures of, you know, the things I made on social media, and started getting orders and uh, people asking me to make things. And so I thought, okay, I'll make this a business. Um, and so that's what I did. And then I had my second child, and I finally figured out that the amount of hours that you have to put into making a really beautiful cake versus what you can charge for it is like <laughs> prison wages, like seven cents an hour. Oh, no. So I thought this is not as lucrative. It's, it's right now it's a hobby with um, a little bit of pocket change, you know, but if I want to make it more lucrative, where can I make more money and still do the thing that I love to do? So I transitioned into um, doing more savory things. I got my certification as a personal chef and started my own personal chef and catering business. So that was the next phase. <laughs> wow. Amazing. And um, I, I really enjoyed it. It was great. My kids got older I put them in theater because that was something I had loved and I thought I'll see if they like it. They started doing a lot of things with um, a theater company in town and I would start volunteering, you know, oh, you need somebody to do this, to do that, to sell tickets. I'll do that. I got to know the people that um, worked there and then they came to know that I had a theater background and a production background and all of that. So they asked me if I wanted to start working for them. And I thought about it. And, you know, as much as I loved the food business, I was a one woman show. And so catering a cocktail party, everything, the prep, the hauling things back and forth, the cleanup, everything was on me. And it was, um, it was a lot. It was kind of backbreaking, you know, at times. Um, and I thought, is this something I kind of want to transition to? So I thought I tried to do both for a while. And I did, I did, I still did the personal chef service and I was producing. And then um, I was having to say no to more catering jobs because they were conflicting with the run of a show. And then the pandemic came and people, you know, were no longer ordering meals prepared by other people. You weren't going into people's homes to cater things. And the um, theater job became busier because we suddenly had to pivot and figure out how can we still make art? We're gonna have to go online, you know, and figure all of that stuff out. So it, it sort of, um, so the catering business kind of came to a natural end at the same time that the theater producing was really picking up. And so I went with it, which is kind of what I've done my whole life. You know, I, I go with it. And then if I'm not as excited about it anymore as I used to, I think, well, what am I excited about now? What do I want to try or what path do I want to take next? So that's kind of how I've meandered my way around the things I love to do. Wow. Well, it is so inspirational because I love how you were really enjoying one thing and then you moved and then you kind of thought, well, what else can I try? And then you threw yourself fully into it to see if really, you know, you did. And then you did. And I also love that you're, you're always, you always have the wheels turning and you're always innovating. And I think that's what, you know, sort of keeps you young and, you know, keeps the brain synapses firing. And I especially love what you said about how when you're in a position of where you're not quite where you want to be, uh, doing the things that you see need to be done, uh, you know, before you're asked to. Is there a fine line between doing those things and like stepping on toes or do you not worry about that or? 
Like, how'd you feel at the time? I think that you, I think that you always have to be humble. You have to know that you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to learn, to keep your eyes open, to ask questions. And I think as long as you approach things with that kind of attitude, I think other people can see that and they don't feel like you're trying to undermine them or, you know, step on their toes. I think they can see that, um, you know, if, if your main motivation is what can I do to help? How can I be helpful? I, I think that um, that can take you a long way. Definitely. Oh yeah. It's not the, it's not the all about Eve, you know, thing where you're just doing this to right. get ahead. You genuinely, and people can sense that, oh, I love that. Oh, that's, that's really brilliant. <laughs> and I think when people are kind of on the road to success, they, they forget that. They get solely focused on, you know, how can I climb the ladder? And it's like, no, you have to, you know, um, sort of accept where you are to start and then see how you can help. And then it'll be a natural progression. Yeah. So, I, think you, I think you always have to be a student. You just have to have the mindset of a student. Like, I want to learn. I want to soak up. I have people that can mentor me. I have people, you know, I can learn from people how I don't want to be or how I don't want to conduct business. And I can also look at the people and think I want to emulate that person and their work ethic, you know? Ah, oh, that's huge. You had to always be open. Um, so I was going to say, we have a series of titled Go For It. If people want to start their own businesses or start their own artistic endeavors. And do you have advice for people who might be scared to take that leap? Because that, that's pretty scary. You know, it is scary. And I, I do want to say that, you know, I had the advantage that I have a spouse that has a full time stable job. And I realize 100% that that gave me the privilege of being a little more free to say, I'm going to try this. What's the worst that can happen if it fails? You know, I, I wasn't counting um, on this to pay my mortgage or feed my kids, you know, not not totally. So I realized that that's um, a pressure that a lot of people have. And I've also noticed in my life, the older we get, the more fearful we become. You know, we have more to lose. We have more at stake. We have more, maybe a crisis of faith sometimes about, oh, who do I think I am that I, why do I think I could just do that? And I think that you have to not think too much. I think that this is probably counter to what any business school would teach you. <laughs> but what works for me was don't have a plan. Like, don't think too far ahead. Don't do all the spreadsheets that show you, you know, how this is not a practical idea or how it might fail because you're going to talk yourself out of doing it. Sometimes you just need to go for it and just focus on today, tomorrow, this week. Don't think about a year from now, two years from now. I think that's not the time to do that in the beginning, at least not for me, because I would 100% talk to myself out of everything. I would convince myself that there was no way I could do this. I'm not qualified. Who do I think I am? Um, but, you know, I still had enough of that impulsive, youthful, of course I can do it. Why couldn't I do it? Anybody can do it. I can do whatever I want, you know, and a little bit of stubbornness as well. <laughs> To be like, wait, well, if you tell me I can't do it, I'm definitely doing it. <laughs> you know, a, a healthy so, stubbornness, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's for me, it, it was wise to not weigh all the pros and cons, but to just think about how great would it to be, be to be doing something every day that I was really excited about and passionate about. Yeah. You know, that's some of the best and then, advice and, I've heard, really. Because I think it's it's so easy to talk ourselves out of it, so much easier than taking that leap, uh, but ultimately we'll be so much happier when we do. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you can convince yourself to say yes, when everything inside of you is screaming, no, 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 you got to say yes, like face your fear, because really what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. maybe it doesn't work out maybe you have to switch gears and try something else. Yeah. And I think the other thing that um, worked for me was I was able to start small, you know, start with, um, for example, like with the, the cake business, you know, I started posting pictures online and then 
that got some attention and people would call me to make something. And then I had a friend who wrote for a bridal magazine. And so she did an article featuring some of my cupcakes. So that got some national attention. And then I had another friend that worked for an ad agency and their client was Duncan Hines. And so he put me together with them and they hired me to start creating recipes for their websites, for their boxes, you know, things like that for their, um, they did a little web series video where I demonstrated making some, you know, recipes, all the things you could do with cake mix. So I think that, um, you know, can you start small? If you can do it, you know, you don't have to jump off the cliff on day one. You know, just take a little step down, see how the land looks, and, you know, and go from there. So um, that that's what worked for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I love that so much. And I also love that you used your contacts as well when you were, some people are like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to, but you, you got to put it out there and then someone could pick it up here and yeah. someone could pick it up there and that's how it really grows. So it's having the confidence to say, look, look what I'm doing. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. And that is hard because I'm the kind of person also that, you know, doesn't want to like, I don't want to bother people. I don't want to, you know, knock on their door. When I was a kid selling Girl Scout cookies, I hate it. I didn't, I'd be like, oh, you don't want to buy any cookies, do you? But you, <laughs> you really do. You, you kind of have to be, when you're an entrepreneur, you, you have to become good at self-promotion. And I think now, especially with um, social media and how, that is one of your main advertising um, mediums, you know, word of mouth and social media. You, you really have to force yourself to get in there and post your pictures, advertise your, your service, your talents, your goods, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's ex excellent advice. And although you have been monumentally successful, um, how do you navigate those roadblocks that I assume came your way as they always do? Yeah. Always. I think that um, the first thing that I figured out was you have to operate with integrity. And, and by that, I mean, you have to treat people well. You have to, you know, when you're starting out in a business, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes that maybe impact your client. You're going to maybe deliver a product one day that's not up to your normal standards. And I've found that if you make it right, you know, if you own up to your mistake, if you say, I'm going to fix that, if you're ask yourself, what have I learned from this? How can I do better next time? How can I be more productive? How can I improve the quality of this? I think that um, people respect that and they see that and they're willing to stick with you. You know, I think that um, if you have integrity, success will follow. Mm. So um and, and you know like what i said before like be a student and always be willing to learn all that you don't know already like you know know what you don't know i think networking taking classes um reading books practicing having mentors i think um all of those things you know have helped me to navigate around um you know, things that have happened, roadblocks, mistakes I've made, mm -hmm. things that have gone wrong. And, and you just kind of also have to develop a little bit of a thick skin and just pick yourself up and dust yourself off. And, you know, and, and then the, the last part too, is I think you have to keep checking in with yourself and saying, do I still love this? Mm -hmm. You know, and if the answer is no, why is that? you know, has something changed? Has the way I'm going about it changed? Can I tweak something to get back to, you know, being excited about this? Um, I think those are kind of the general, yeah. the general things that I've tried to follow. Well, and I've heard that the most successful people too, they may have a career for 30 years, but they say, I'm always learning. I'm always looking to older yes. people for what they know, younger people for what they know, and not ever feeling like you, you, we know it all. It's that mix of confidence and humility, I think, that really makes a business work. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, that's what's going to keep it interesting, too. You know, if you're willing to learn and add things and tweak things and improve things, that, that keeps it exciting for you. Who wants to do the same exact thing every single day for your entire life? 
No, it's not so me. True. Not me either. And I, you know, if you're if you're lying in bed thinking to yourself, oh, I've got to, you know, cater something for a hundred people tomorrow, and you were tired, and the kids were up, or whatever. Were there things yeah. you would tell yourself to keep yourself motivated and on track? Remember? Yeah, I, I would, I would tell myself, you know, these people are expecting my best, my best food, my best attitude, my best presentation. And um, I can't disappoint them. So I have to take everything that I'm stressed about today, and I got to put it in this drawer for now, and I'll unpack that later. But I, you know, I have to focus on on what I'm doing. And, you know, when it really is your own business and you're not an employee of somebody else's business, it matters. Like everything is a reflection on you, who you are, what you stand for, what you believe. And um, I think I, uh, I, I felt like, I can't, I can't do myself dirty like that. <laughs> you know, I can't phone it in. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's interesting. You mentioned not working for someone else, which is it's great. And it's also hard. What did you like best about owning your own business? Making my own schedule because mm -hmm. that was really key because, you know, my choice was to stay home with my kids and I wanted to do a lot of things with them. You know, I was the the president of the PTA for a while. I was a Girl Scout leader for my now 18 year old from kindergarten to when they graduated. And um, it was really important to me to be involved with them and there for them. And that was my number one priority. So the fact that I chose careers that I could schedule around them was key to that working for my life. and um key for me continuing to enjoy the job and be passionate and not have it feel like a burden but still an adventure you know and um so that that was really the key to those things being successful for me mm -hmm. i think as moms sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day of taking care of the kids that we really do lose a part of ourselves maybe we had a career before having kids and it's so yeah. important to keep those fires stoked, especially because as you know, we end up empty nesters. So then where do we go from there? So it's, it's yeah. wonderful that you always had that going for yourself. Yeah, because that was, you know, and that was something I never felt guilty about. Like I, I knew, you know, I was maybe, I think my oldest was maybe nine months old when I thought this is great. And I chose this and I don't regret it, but there's a part of my brain that is dying right now and I need to get something back for me, which is when I started taking all the pastry classes and the cake decorating classes and when that business idea was born. And, um, and you know, you, you can't be a great partner, a great parent, unless you are nurturing that part of you that, um, that you need to be well, it's like I always say to my kids, to be interesting, you have to be interested in the world, in a subject, in a hobby, in a job. You know, I think my worst fear was like going to a cocktail party and somebody saying, oh, what's new with you? And me saying, nothing, <laughs> not a thing. Yeah. You know, so, so for me, I was like, I, I, I have to find something that I'm interested in. And then I will be more interesting as a happy side effect of that, you know? Yes. Oh, for sure. Wow. I, I need to let that like sink in for a moment. That's so <laughs> great. And I think it's so important for moms to hear that we don't have to feel guilty for pursuing our own passions while we're raising mm -hmm. our kids. No. Wow. I mean, don't you, don't you also want to be a role model to your kids to, um, to go after th things in life that are important to them, you know, mm -hmm. to always be finding things that excite you. Um, I don't think, I don't think any kid would resent their parent for following their passions, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. At least I would hope not. I would, right. It is one of the best lessons we can teach our kids, I think, to, to really go after what we want in life and to work hard and to have them see us working hard at that 
that's the modeling of that kind of behavior we want them to do when they get to be, you know, adults. Yeah. And I know women in particular, you know, we, we um, can tend to have a lot of guilt around the whole work-life balance. And I know tons of women that struggle with that. Um, so I, I get that, but I guess I felt like I know that I'm being a good mom. I don't have to feel bad about taking some time out to be um, the best me for me, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Wow. You are so inspirational. <laughs> you really are. I just love listening to you. Uh-huh. Um, what are some tools people can have in their toolbox to keep them motivated if they want to start their own business or start a new endeavor and you know keep themselves on track? Yeah, I, you know, going back to well, when I just mentioned work-life balance, I think that um, from my experience, I had to do things like um, set a timer for how long I was going to work on the business because it was so easy. It still is easy for me, especially with the the theater production to sit down at the computer and say, Oh, I'm just going to answer a few emails, get a couple things done. And then I'm going to go do something else. And then suddenly it's six hours later (laughs) and you know, I still haven't stepped away and I haven't done those other things that I really needed to get done. So I think that, um, you know, putting yourself on a schedule, set the timer, tell you, tell yourself, okay, I can afford to, dedicate three hours right now to set that timer when the three hours are done I'm going to walk away whether I'm done or not and I'll come back to it in my next scheduled time zone to do that um and then finding other things that keep you grounded like I don't think you can singularly focus on any one thing in your life and that includes a career a business or something so for me you know things like I have this app called calm which has meditation and nature sounds and if I find that I'm just starting to spiral I know that I need to step away and just put in the earbuds and and listen to some kind of meditation for 10 minutes Um, And during the pandemic, you know, when your house is always full of people, sometimes that means getting in the car and driving somewhere to a park and parking and just being alone and silent. Um, Yoga, exercise, you know, those things are helpful. Um, I was really good for a long time about using a bullet journal as well. I don't know if you're familiar with those. It's basically like a journal where you kind of make your bullet points of all the things that you want or need to accomplish that day. and You kind of cross them off. I get huge satisfaction out of crossing things off a to-do list. My kids make fun of me for that. The one that I've done just so I can cross it off. Yes. But that bullet journal was helpful to go back at the times where you're having a little crisis of faith and thinking, oh, I'm not doing enough to make my career go forward or what have I accomplished you can kind of go back and look at it on paper you know what I did that I did that I did all the things I said I was going to do on Monday so good for me (laughs) um and then I think also having people that you can network with in in your chosen field that you can be inspired by that you can ask advice of um you know podcasts, reading books. Um, I still, as far as the cooking, I still make probably three new recipes every week. I still oh, have really? a buck I I still have a pastry bucket list of all of these very complicated patisserie items that I am determined to like bake my way through. So that someday when I'm called to be a contestant on the Great British Bake Off, I'll be ready. Yes. <laughs> So, um, you know, those, those kinds of things, you know, now that I'm a theater producer, making sure I go out and see live theater, whether it's on Broadway or locally, um, just always keeping, keeping it fresh. I really think keeping it fresh and, um, you know, giving yourself credit Mm -hmm. for what you've done, you know, even if you haven't reached the top yet you're making progress, you're making, you're taking steps. Yeah, I think sometimes we focus on 
every, the negative, everything that went wrong. And if we take a moment to say, but look at everything that went right, that can give us such a great boost, especially in, in a business sense or an artistic sense. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like if, you're, if your best friend called you and said, oh, I feel like such a failure and my business isn't where I want to be yet. Think of what you would ask them and what kind of pep talk you would give them. And then give that to yourself. Like you should at least be as kind to yourself as you would be to a friend, a family member, a child. Isn't that true? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. Yeah, and again, I, I love the idea of always being open and, and trying new things. And because the truth is, what really, you know, if you were going to do, you know, something patisserie wise, and let's say it didn't go well, not that it wouldn't go well, but if it didn't, you know, what's the worst that happens? Uh, oh, well, but you still tried. You still did it. Yeah. What you know, yeah, it's funny. It, you read, um, I read many times, I've read this culinary advice about never try a new recipe when you have guests over for dinner. And I never follow that advice because, you, you know, I kind of think to myself, I have guests over, I consider them to be friends. And you know what? I feel comfortable enough to, if it's the worst case scenario and the dinner's horrible, we'll pick up the phone and order pizza. Yeah. Like, what have you lost? You know, it's only food. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> That's a great attitude. <laughs> so tell us about Gaslamp Players. What's happening? How have you pivoted? What's happening hopefully in the spring? Tell us everything. Yeah, so, you know, it was really tough. I mean, Broadway shut down. There were so many um, theater people, actors, production people, creative people that uh, are really struggling, you know, financially and creatively, because what do we do in a pandemic when you can't perform live? So we pivoted and we found a way to do, we did a, a teen cabaret that was online via Zoom. We actually did a play with all of the Zoom boxes for all the characters and entrances and exits. And we had um, a uh, like a Zoom background that looked like the period of the, the time that the play was set in. So we have been doing our best to do that. And then we actually were able in the fall to do a live production outdoors. Um, we did a production of Carrie. We performed it right before Halloween. And um, it was with our teens and we were able to rehearse for a few months outside with masks, social distancing, you know, they all had to fill out their COVID questionnaire and, and um, all of that every day. And we even were able to seat the audience socially distanced. I had my tape measure putting all those chairs six feet apart. And we were so thrilled that we pulled off that production. We didn't have a, a single COVID case, you know, with an audience, staff, cast member, nothing like that. And the, the biggest reward was just how grateful the kids and their families were that they got to perform something live. Um, there was even a little article in uh, the Broadway World website that somebody wrote who had come to see our production, who was basically saying, good for them for being able to do this. You know, more people should follow this example because it can be done. They pulled it off. So that was really great. And now for spring, we're planning, um, we're doing Spring Awakening. And we actually have auditions uh, coming up at the end of this month. And our plan is to start our rehearsal process virtually using Zoom until the weather's warm enough that we can be outside, masked, distanced and then uh, the performance will again be outside in May. Wow now will that be recorded so we can all watch it from our homes do you think? You know no the thing is when you license these shows you know from MTI or um, whoever you're licensing from they have very specific Right. requirements of you know what if you're allowed to record if you're not you have to do a recording license so sometimes we can record them you know for posterity for ourselves or for our mm -hmm. cast members but we're usually not allowed to post them on YouTube and post them publicly so right. unfortunately that makes sense yeah we're restricted by that and we have to follow the rules so of course yes 
yeah. but I'm just so thrilled that you were able to do it in the fall and you'll be able to do it again in the spring because we have we have so missed being able to go and get inspired by live theater and shows and it's just so remarkable that's so wow, that's so great and where can we find Gaslamp players online we'll have it done it, we are at yeah we're at www.gaslampplayers.org and um, the other, I don't know what our summer camps are gonna look like yet. We normally have a summer camp, theater camp for teens and one for younger kids as well. And we've done those for years and we haven't been able to do those, uh, weren't able to do those last summer in person. But we did find a way to do an online camp. And what was pretty amazing was somebody did an article about us for um, Real Simple, their website. And from that article, we got kids who did this virtual camp from all over all over the United States. We even had one camper from um, Qatar, who I can't even tell you the time difference that they had to get up to attend this camp. But we shipped their package of crafts and materials all the way to them. So it was kind of amazing to see kids from all over the country and they got to meet each other and come together in this creative artistic way. So, you know, there, there have been positives mm -hmm. to the pandemic, I dare say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't all been bleak and depressing. Those silver linings just, they just keep me going because that would have never happened otherwise. So how incredible. Yeah. Will that be this summer too or you'll, you'll see? I think we'll have to see. We're we're just starting to. We just don't know. I think that's the one thing we've we've learned. You know, in this pandemic, is you just kind of got to take it a, a few weeks at a time and just roll with it. So uh, we don't know right now. We're hoping we'd love to do something. You know, again in person outside, even if it's masked and um, you know socially distant, mm -hmm. we'll take it. Well, and then I would imagine too, you could do so much more bo body work and, you know, and expression work, I guess, from here up, right? You know, that was actually really remarkable. So when we did our Carrie production, I had looked into the clear masks because I thought, you know, you're missing so much when you can't see a performer's mouth and the way they, you know, express themselves. So we tried out some different clear masks that didn't really work. Our kids were dancing, they were singing, they had, you know, mics. Uh, um, it, it didn't work. So we went with just the regular masks. But I can't tell you how many audience members told us that within five minutes, the masks just kind of disappeared for them. And they were so drawn in by the kids, you know, we would, we would tell the kids, you really got to act with your eyes and your eyebrows. And, and they said, I didn't even notice anymore that I couldn't see all of their face. So, you know, that was a big win. Yeah, especially going toward the future. That's really great to, to know that, that that's possible. Oh yeah. my goodness, wow. Well, tell us last question. What are you most looking forward to when things open up again? Oh, so many things. Um, hugs for <laughs> one, hugging people, seeing my parents and siblings, you know, we haven't been able to travel to see them. Traveling, uh, eating in restaurants, haven't done that in, in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, being alone in my house, just now and then, <laughs> in the house to myself. <laughs> sure. Well, that goes Don't back to- Don't tell my kids or husband oh, I said that. <laughs> I didn't hear anything. <laughs> it has been such a joy to talk to you. I have learned so much. Thank you, Meredith. We will have Gaslamp players listed down there. I so appreciate your time and, and all of your insights. You're, you're just wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. You just lift anybody's spirits that speaks oh, with you. So, Thank you. <laughs> Stay well. We'll see you soon. Mwah. Okay. Bye. Bye.